Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. Hello and welcome. This is Rasmudi Chakraborty, and joining today for book talks is Kenneth Stern, the director of Bird Center for Study of Hate at Bird College, an award-winning author and attorney. He was the American Jewish Committee's expert on anti-Semitism for 25 years, and was the lead drafter of the International Holocaust Remembrance Association's Walking Definition of Anti-Semitism, which has now been adopted by many countries around the world. He's also the author of a new book titled The Conflicts Over the Conflict, the Israel-Palestine Campus Debate, which examines why the Israeli-Palestine conflict has become such a divisive and toxic issue on campus and what can be done about it. So I read the book and I highly recommend it to all my viewers reading it. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ken, for taking your time and speaking to us. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. So I believe this is one of your first interviews about the book uh, uh, from an Indian audience. As far as I know, yeah. So let's uh, delve into the idea because uh, I, I thoroughly read, uh, enjoyed reading the book. So I want to first start about the definition uh, uh, of anti-Semitism. So could you tell us a little bit about the experience of actually writing that definition of anti-Semitism and probably what are the challenges you encountered? Because uh, anything which you try to define will also come with certain challenges because it certainly puts things in black and white. So if you could tell us a little bit about that. Well, sure. And that's a bit of an involved story, but I'm happy to share it with you. So as you were mentioning, I was the director of the Division of Anti-Semitism at the American Jewish Committee, where I'd worked for 25 years. And in the early 2000s, uh, you, you, know, you may recall that there was an uptick in anti-Semitism uh, when the peace process collapsed, when the Second Intifada began, and there were attacks uh, that sort of spiked against Jews in uh, various places around the world, including uh, places in Europe. And there was a group called the European Monitoring Center on Xenophobia and Racism that was um, part of the, the structure looking at questions about racism and hatred and so forth in the EU. They're now folded into the fundamental rights agency of the EU, uh, but it was called the EUMC at the time. And what happened is they put out a report that looked at anti-Semitism and particularly the anti-Semitic events that were happening in Europe in that period of time. And the report had a couple of observations, which I found of interest. One, which I fully agreed with, it said, look, we have all these data collectors in different countries in Europe, and there's no common definition, there's no common frame of reference to tell these folks um, what to include and what not to include in their, their country reports. So to have something that made sense across borders, it had something that had made sense across time so we could see about trends in anti-Semitism, I agreed with them fully that it, was, it, was, it would be good to have something uh, to be more directed to these uh, data collectors. Um, the second thing is that they said, well, for the moment, what we'll do is we'll have a, a type of a definition about anti-Semitism that looks at it as stereotypes about Jews, you know, Jews being greedy, Jews being clannish, Jews trying to, you know, control the world, Jews, all, all the sort of classic anti-Semitic stereotypes. And the reason that they did that, I think, was because they were facing a political problem. And the political problem was, well, what do you do if a Jew on the streets of, say, Paris was beat up as a stand-in for an Israeli? Um, and they basically concluded, look, if the person has these ideas about Jews that are these stereotypes, transfers them to Israelis and then retransfers them back to the Jew in front of them, that's anti-Semitism. But if somebody attacks a Jewish person because they're upset about an Israeli government action, I said that's lamentable, but shouldn't be included in the account of anti-Semitism. And my personal experience growing up in the United States in the 50s and 60s, I mean, that, that struck me as, as, as problematic to say the least, because the parallel would be 
uh, imagine a black person that was lynched in the South in the United States because somebody had stereotypes about blacks. I mean, you know, liftless or lazy or whatever. And did that racism. But if, you know, if somebody killed this poor same black person in the same way because they were upset at a Martin Luther King speech or a passage of a Civil Rights Act, that wouldn't be included. So that struck me as, as nuts. And I started speaking out about that. And it just so happened that the head of the EUMC uh, was coming to an American Jewish Committee meeting um, that spring. And I took the opportunity to push her on that, especially since just a couple of weeks before her visit, uh, Israel had assassinated a Hamas leader and somebody retaliated by firebombing a, a Jewish day school in Canada. Not anti-Semitism according to what they had put out. So that opened an opportunity to have discussions with them. I, as you said, I was the lead drafter. I worked with other uh, colleagues from around the world. And we came up with a definition that uh, was primarily, not exclusive, but primarily designed to allow the data collectors to have a consistent base and to take in the sort of character of what was happening in the world of, of anti-Semitic uh, incidents and anti-Semitism writ large. Um, there was a part of it that I was particularly concerned about um, that dealt with hate crimes, because you may recall that there were times where people would say, well, when somebody uh, attacked a Jewish person, was that anti-Semitic or not? There were cases where uh, a Jew might be kidnapped and because people thought Jews were wealthy. Well, the debate to be in the press is that a positive stereotype or could it be anti-Semitism? So the, it was driving also the looking at hate crime didn't matter if you had a positive or negative stereotype or any stereotype at all. It took from American jurisprudence um, the idea that, that you're not looking at the motive as much as the intent. When you pick somebody to be a victim of a crime, as we saw in the United States recently, you know, with the attacks on Asians and so forth, it doesn't matter what you think about them. If you attack somebody just because they're an Asian person, um, that should be counted as a hate crime. So that was part of it too. And was also trying to use it for diplomatic relations. We thought that there were problems in the diplomatic world that this would be a useful tool for. And there were um, a number of examples about Israel um, in the, the text of the definition, precisely because we thought that was a part that was underappreciated. And it wasn't to label anybody an anti-Semite. It wasn't to say, that you know, this is something that's a, a huge anti-Semitic thing when somebody says something or, or to narrow down the discussion about is it you know, inside the parameter or the definition or not. It was in recognition of the fact that if you saw that type of rhetoric about Israel spiking um, in the media and so forth, uh, it correlated almost one-to-one -one with attacks on Jews. I had a colleague in London uh, who used to be able to show two charts, one of attacks on Jews, one of, of that type of mention about Israel in the media, you could almost superimpose them. So to get an idea of the temperature, that was the, the, the basis of putting that together. Um, and it was, it was contentious and, and you know, people were debating it. And then in 2016, as you said, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance adopted the definition um, with just a, a really insignificant minor uh, twist or two, but basically the same text. And now it's become more institutionalized. Uh, and my concern, and you know, I'll, I'll express that and then we can take the conversation wherever you want to go, is that in around 2010, I started seeing a problem with not the definition itself, but with how it was being used. And what happened to give you the background of it in the United States, um, the, there's a thing called Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And what it basically says is that on a, in, a, in a university or educational setting, so high schools and grade schools too, um, that if there's a pervasive environment of harassment, intimidation, discrimination against students based on a variety of characteristics, including race, um, the, that could be a violation of the act and theoretically all federal funds could be withheld from the, uh, the, the institution. And I thought that was you know, a good thing. And I thought there was a question for a number of years about whether Jews 
were included or not because it didn't say religion. So there was a clarification in 2010 from the Department of Education that said Jews and Sikhs and Muslims as ethnicities, not as religions, but as ethnicities were covered under this Title VI rubric. And in fact, I brought a case for some Jewish students in uh, high school in upstate New York uh, who were victimized with swastikas being put on their desks and there was a kick of Jew day and the school district did nothing and this was a great tool. But what happened is some people on the pro-Israel uh, right and you know, the Jewish community on the right of the Jewish community in particular started seeing, aha, here's a handy dandy tool, this new power under this Department of Education Title VI clarification and the definition, and then started going and saying, wait a minute, somebody's teaching something that we see as, as outside of the definition on uh, Israel. So a text in a class, a speaker invited in, a public program and so forth, and started in large measure basing these challenges uh, using that law to stop um, you know, or try to chill that type of speech. And that was never what the definition was intended to do. And that's when I started speaking out about it. So it turned out to be the devil which you tried to create uh, in form of basically trying to address the larger question about anti-Semitism, but it's right now kind of used as the devil's uh, point of view. But I had a slight question because uh, in the book, uh, I will actually ask you a couple of basic questions about the book as well. But since uh, the definition came out, I want to ask you that uh, in the pro uh, in the chapter, uh, the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, you mentioned uh, reference to the prolio where you mentioned about the OPEJ co-author with Carrie Nelson, uh, then president of the American Association of the University Professors, and you cautioned him about the abuse of the definition of anti-Semitism to chill pro-Palestine campus expression. So tell the definition when you were writing it, it came to mind that it can be put into blacks and whites and basically say, uh, that if you do not belong to something which I think it what it is, you are anti-Semitic because a large number of conversations that we see on campus uh, revolves around this definition that uh, that has been put forward. That if I don't agree with you, you are this or that. The us versus them debate. Let us start from that definition aspect. Well, you know, a number of things to you know to be said there. First, what what do we want a college to do? Um, in my mind, what we want to do is we want to teach young people uh, how to grow, how to develop, how to become critical thinkers, how to look at the world. And um, you know, perhaps one of the most fundamental things is to how do you react? How do you think when you're disturbed by ideas? Uh, how do you, you know, navigate that? How do you recalibrate what you think about things? Um, those are all parts of, of, I think, as you know, democratic societies in particular, we cherish the producing young people who have that capacity, who are not ideologues, who are not looking to put things in one category or another and then move on, but to examine the complexities as opposed to trying to reduce things to simplicities. Um, and the first chapter of the book, intentionally, before I go into the Israel-Palestine debate in the history and what's happening on campus and so forth, I, I you know, took the time to, to really look from the field of hate studies, what we know uh, about how people think, especially when they have their identity wrapped around an issue of perceived social justice or injustice. It isn't just Israel-Palestine, it could be other issues too. Um, and there's a growing body of literature from the growing field of Interdis, you know, the interdisciplinary field of hate studies and its, and its components that shows really, you know, our minds work in, in ways that we should be cognizant of when our blood gets boiling about these issues. I mean, there's brain science where you can put somebody in an MRI and see how their brain actually functions differently depending on whether they hate somebody or not or showing a picture of somebody of different race or not. There are things that show that we try to reduce complex things to black and white. And you know, that's, that's again, one of the challenges of a definition is it tells people you don't have to think, is it inside, is it outside? And that to me is, is terribly problematic. One of the things that I did at the American Jewish Committee way before, 15 years before I, you know, I, was, I was penning you know, this, uh, this definition um, you know, as a lead drafter, uh, I was working on issues on bigotry on campus. And the thing that I learned from that, working with a lot of different college presidents, 
is, yeah, there are problems of bigotry on campus. Yeah, there are problems um, where you have a, a sort of a conflict between the, the ideal of everybody should be able to say what they think because they should have the space to be wrong and then figure out what they think versus, um, you know, sometimes people are gonna get vilified for what they think. So how do you, you create a campus that minimizes the vilification, says that, you know, people can engage in ideas but makes it clear that nobody should be harassed, intimidated, discriminated against, and so forth. Uh, how do you do that? And the key is to find things that absolutely amplify, or at least don't harm, the idea of academic freedom. Uh, because what you really want to do on a campus is, again, not just give the simple out of, here's a rule. We don't have to look at, um, you know, how people relate to each other, what's being taught, how staff, is treating students. There are a whole bunch of different things that affect the environment and bigotry. And you know, you lose all that if you say, here's a rule of what can be said and what can't be said, what's what's outside the line and what's inside the line. There's also, you know, to me, a, a problem with the sort of push towards, you know, groupthink. Ah, here's a rule. Let's look at you really want students to engage ideas. Um, and to experiment. I mean, when I teach, uh, I tell students the only way for sure to get a bad grade is to parrot back to me what they think I think. I may disagree with them in terms of their conclusions about particular things, but I want to encourage them to, to really examine what they think, to put forth their ideas, to give evidence for it, and I could care less if I disagree or if I think they're wrong, if they make a compelling case. And that's the environment that you want on a college campus, but when you start using a definition to label things, you stop, in fact, thinking and you destroy, in my view, uh, one of the fundamental uh, things that a college campus should do, which is to challenge thinking as opposed to stop thinking. Yeah, and with this, I want to come a little bit about uh, to the aspect of how uh, human beings actually uh, process information and form opinions. Because uh, sometimes when uh, someone's identity is very closely associated, so even in an environment where academia is promoted like a campus, do you think, uh, for example, it blinds us to just look at evidence from one side? Uh, you can also talk from uh, being a perspective of an attorney. When uh, you have to go in a direction, you will just seek information in that direction. So does that happen in, uh, you have experience in teaching in classrooms as well, and you have seen what happens in course. So if you could, uh, interpolate and tell us about, uh, tell to our audience, how does that happen when your identity is closely associated? Do you let go of those inhibitions and look at facts from the other side as well? Well, I think, you know, the evidence is that when people get worked up because they see something threatening who they are, the defenses come up. And again, they want to reduce complex things to simple aspects. And I think, you know, in some ways, um, they become even less likely to, to, express or to exhibit any type of intellectual empathy. I mean, I always found it very important when you're thinking about any, you know, sort of idea that deals with politics in particular or, um, to, or history, to have some empathy, to, to imagine what it would be like if you were born in, in a different circumstance. Would you look at the world differently? Um, you know, you may not uh, ultimately change your view of the equities of the particular thing you're looking at, but to not look at it from a different perspective, uh, to me, you know, diminishes your capacity to, to understand something. When I was a, a trial lawyer for many years uh, before I, I became involved in the American Jewish Committee and that now, you know, in academia, I could never I was a criminal defense attorney. I could never represent somebody in a case if I didn't spend at least some time thinking through, okay, if I were the prosecutor, how would I approach this? Because I think it would be malpractice not to do that. You have to imagine this different scenario. Um, and I think you have to do that um, you know, with issues around identity and issues around politics of, of Israel, Palestine too, to really have that capacity to imagine, okay, if I were born in this circumstance, would I look uh, things somewhat differently. And education should tease those things out. It should encourage students to do that. I mean, uh, I think I mentioned in the, in the book just in passing, but when I teach about anti-Semitism, 
um, and we get to the Nazi period, you know, there's usually a you know, 19 year old, bright, well-meaning student who basically says, how could the Germans have done this? How could they have thought those things? And, you know, it's a good question, but I sort of put it back into, okay, let's imagine. And the probability is despite how awful we see those ideas and knowing now exactly where they led to, the chances are that if she as a 19 year old were living in Berlin or Frankfurt or you know, any other German city at that time in the 30s, she probably would have seen the, the you know, Nazism as something positive because all her neighbors did and the whole structure, the media, everybody was, was promoting it. Um, so, you know, it, it's important to have some historical perspective and not just to get into this sort of purity thing where we, you know, dislike the politics or we like, and, ooh, you know, how could people do that? It's more important to understand how people could think that way. In the United States now, um, I don't know if you know the news media here, but we have, you know, CNN and MSNBC are sort of the liberal things on cable news and on the sort of right wing, there's Fox News and then to the right of that, there's the One America Network and a thing called Newsmax. And a few years ago, I, I said to my wife, you know, I'm making a huge mistake. I get most, of, I get my news from a lot of different sources, but on cable news, I watch mostly CNN and MSNBC. So I have to watch a lot of these other things because there are millions of people there that see the world through that lens. And she and a lot of my friends, how could you do that? Don't want to be disgusted. And I said, no, I'm, I mean, I don't agree with it. I find a lot of it disturbing, but it's intellectually frequently consistent. Um, and I have to understand there are millions of people that see the world that way. How can I not have the imagination to see what they're seeing and to try to think what they're thinking to understand that dynamic better because it does have an impact on all our lives. Yeah, and uh, I want to now talk a little bit about the book, which we should have started with, but uh, we a little digress into the definition part. Uh, tell us how, what prompted you to write the book. Uh, so if you could talk a little bit about your personal experience of your life and how much it impacted with the ideas that you presented in the book. For example, uh, you, uh, you talk about the historical context of the Aryan nations and how they were source of anti-Semitism and white supremacy. You could start a little from there and about your personal experience as well. Well, I think I heard most of that, but so correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you know, you're asking what my experience is, how they led me to the, the book. But the, yeah. the, yeah, so- And I the mean, historical said, context. And it's what? The historical context that you present in the context. book, the Aryan sure. nations part. Yeah, okay, sure, sure. So, you know, what, what happened was that um, there was a, my background is I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 68. I've had a, a, a lot of careers in different different uh, venues in a way. Like I said I was a trial lawyer, I was at the National Jewish Agency. Um, and I, you know, first started thinking about hatred and anti-Semitism when I was a trial lawyer. And I was working at issues that represent American Indian movement folks and others and seeing the hatred play out and seeing things of anti-Semitism too. Uh, and seeing it playing out among political allies and people that I found, um, you know, including the neo-Nazis were having an impact. I was grew up in New York City, but I was out in Oregon where those folks were much more active and much more uh, visible. Um, you know, then what happened was there was a group called the Aryan Nations that uh, was really sort of the ground zero of neo-Nazi white supremacy in the United States. It was in the Northern Panhandle of Idaho, but it had impacts in uh, various parts of the country. They were doing robberies, they did assassinations, it was terrorism. Um, and there was a, a guy who uh, I wish more people knew about. He, he's to me one of my heroes, a, a guy named Bill Wasmuth, who was a parish priest in Northern Idaho. And he uh, started speaking out when these folks were intimidating the few blacks and Jews and others in the community. And they firebombed his house in retaliation with him in it. And that just you know, pissed him off basically. And he left the priesthood and organized this group that pushed back against the Aryan nations uh, and all forms of hate in that region. And he had asked me to come and speak 
at a uh, conference and I asked Bill, I said, you know, what would you like me to do? He wanted me to give a keynote. And he said, well, challenge us to do something that we aren't already doing. And I, I said to him, you know, that's a tough ask because when I talk around the country about what people should be doing to organizing against hate and hate groups, you're the model I hold up. Um, but then it occurred to me that the people that came to his meetings, his annual meetings, were people like me representing national uh, religious and, and uh, ethnic agencies. There were police officials, there were uh, labor union members, there were you know, others that were coming because they were concerned about this because of the work they were doing for their day job. Academics were coming because they were personally interested. And there wasn't the connection to um, you know, the ongoing anti-bigotry work. And on top of that, it dawned on me that, and, and Bill picked on this very quickly, that the groups that were fighting bigotry at large or a particular type of bigotry weren't being informed by the academic community. We were sort of shooting in the dark to use his words. We didn't know what worked and what didn't. We know what felt good. We know when there's something that made us angry and how we reacted. We knew what would be good for getting fundraising, um, or at least we thought we did. But there was no sort of, how do you know that you're having an impact on how people think? How do you reduce bigotry in politics? How do you, what do you do? How do we know that? So that was the beginning of the idea of the, the field of hate studies. And that informed, again, a lot of what, uh, what was in the first chapter of the book. And again, what I'm you know, thinking as, as I, I was writing the book um, and it's in its other aspects too, how to how to think about what actually has an has an impact, and part of that again looks to issues of of um, not every institution is exactly the same. A campus is not the same as a business. It's not the same as politics. Um, but you know, part of what I wanted to do is to take what we know and apply it to the particular institution that's the campus to try to again make it be the place where students welcome being disturbed by ideas um, and learn how to think you know, for themselves. Uh, and moving forward, uh, how did it all start in campuses? If you could uh, give a brief background of how this debate started, unfolded. Uh, for Israel, we can understand that after the formation about in 1948, we saw there was a certain amount of academic discourse. So how does the debate all started in campuses where the other group is trying to censor the another? That's a great question. So if you look back, I mean, again, for people who know the sort of the formation of, of Israel, it was you know, declared in 1948, the UN in 47 created uh, what was gonna be an Israeli, you know, Jewish state and an Arab state. Um, and you know the background. I have the the competing narratives in the book. The Jewish narrative uh, to inform the story is that Jews are connected to the land of Israel. Jews, you know, that's where Jewish people came from. It's where the temples uh, were, um, the language spoken there in biblical times is the language that the you know Israelis speak now. There's there's a strong connection to the land. And there's, um, given the history of anti-Semitism in Europe, particularly the pogroms, let alone before the Holocaust, the pogroms were attacks on Jews in the 18, late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, there was a, a, a movement called Zionism, which was you know, Jewish self-determination, the idea of um, Jews should be able to defend themselves and particularly in, in the historic homeland. Now that, competes with the idea of from a Palestinian perspective of, wait a minute, we've been here for you know, a long, 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 long time. Uh, we've had Jews among us, um, but you know, why were all these other Jews coming in and really destroying our ability to, to control our lives just by numerically and what the land they were buying up and so forth. So you have two competing national narratives and I laid them out you know, in the, in the book um, about how each side looks at, at its own narrative. It's an overlayer of politics on this too. So in 1948, the progressive forces in the world 
Um, and I have a quotation from a resolution from a progressive group called the National Lawyers Guild, which is very much uh, pro-Palestinian now, but back in 48 was um, just, you know, absolutely uh, clear that it wanted Israel to not only flourish, but survive. Um, it, and because that was sort of the anti-imperialist line. I mean, this is like the, the uh, after World War II ends um, and the Brits had the mandate for Palestine, um, the, the progressive forces around the world wanted to do something that was seen as anti-imperialistic and the, the structure of the organized Jewish community at the time was very much aligned with the socialist movement, kibbutzes and so forth. So very much pro-Israel in 48. Flip forward to the politics of 67 in the 67 war um, and that I think realigned people's views. Uh, the Soviet Union was much more uh, aligned with the, you know, the unaligned nations, you know, the developing world. Um, and there was a, a switch where Israel was then seen, um, you know, in different terms uh, as the aggressor. And for, you know, for, I grew up remembering 67 and wondering if Israel was going to be wiped off the map. We thought, you know, that was, uh, my parents were worrying about a second Holocaust because I haven't seen the first one and lost relatives in it. My kids, now, you know, have never known Israel not to be secure. They know there are threats, but they don't see it as vulnerable as I did. So all those things, the time and perspective play onto it. What's happening on campus though, is that it's become such a, a divisive issue that each side with different means is trying to shout down and stop the other because they've gotten to the point where instead of seeing this as a, conf as a difficult conflict with competing national narratives. Um, they s try to put, again, justice all on one side or justice all on the other side. So if you see the world that way and the other side is totally unjust, you know, a Nazi equivalent, the argument becomes, how can you let them speak? How can you have a conversation with them? They are such a reprehensible point of view. You would not do that with others. How could we do that here? So the, what got me to, to focus on the book was the danger I saw to the campus from both sides. I saw the pro-Palestinian side sometimes trying to stop speakers from speaking at campus. I saw them promoting an academic boycott of Israeli academic institutions, which is really a boycott of Israeli academics. Um, and the academy is a place where ideas should be evaluated on their merit, not on the basis of the nationality of somebody who's proposing it, right? So I've seen all these things that violate the basic core of what an academy is supposed to be on the pro-Palestinian side. On the pro-Israel side, um, I saw the attempt particularly to use law uh, and again to codify the definition as a way of, um, as a, you know, sort of a way as somebody once said to, to hunt witches, uh, to, to censor speech and suppress speech. So each side is trying to, to suppress the other. Um, and to me, you know, that's not only damaging uh, to the students who are there, um, but it's also damaging to the purpose of the academy. And, it's, and it's, a, it's a shame because we miss an opportunity. The academy is really, it's one of the arguments, main arguments of the book, is really an ideal place to create the environment to explore ideas like this, rather than just to label people, you know, as good or evil, and then you know have debates about. It. Nobody on the campus is going to solve Israel Palestine, but to, how to learn how to think and using this as a vehicle for it is a real good opportunity. Uh, and uh, how can, for example, uh, you mentioned about uh, the idea of how it started. So there is this notion that's going on in campuses that, for example, as you mentioned in the book, it's where the number of people who are working for pro-Palestine was much more, uh, much more a higher number compared to, for example, to Israel in proportion. It, I think you mentioned about two to one ratio that time. And there is also this notion of actually calling out whoever writes about, uh, for example, in your recent case that I'm mentioning is about calling right-winger lawmakers uh, when you try to go and talk, have a conversation about Israel. 
So do you think there is an academic boycott, especially when a conversation happens and uh, generally the notion goes that the left supports the pro-Palestine stance and which is more like an academic stance and when the right say something about the Israel is always looked down upon? Well, you know, the campus is, is very varied. And again, you know, as I pointed out in the book, it looks at North American campuses, most particularly American campuses, but there are about 4,000 US campuses. And the reality is, is Israel is a issue on very few of them, a very small percentage. I mean, you know, certainly some of the more significant campuses do, you know, come under the concerns about Israel, but for most campuses, no. And as you point out, the data suggests that every year there are uh, twice as many pro-Israel uh, events on campus than, than anti-Israel. Uh, but that being said, there are some places where it does become very much of a, of a heated issue with uh, people sort of you know, picking sides and having um, you know, sort of a, a verbal war over these things. Um, and you know, I, again, I, I see that as, as problematic um, you know, from, from both, I get it when you're, listen, I, as I said earlier in our conversation, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. I was at the tail end of the anti-Vietnam War movement. Uh, I remember going to civil rights protests and so forth. I get it when, you know, you see justice and, you know, I think it's great when young people see the world and see it as unjust and want to change it. That, that's, that, that's wonderful. The problem is, when you get to the point on a campus where you have this sort of abstract view of you want you know to be somehow morally pure, you want to uh, you know disparage somebody else that has a different point of view uh, as evil, um, you know to be a good organizer again to say you know I was not the best criminal defense lawyer but I was competent because. I looked at what the other side views was, were with an open mind to better argue my case. To create that environment on a campus, to me, is, is much more important than saying somehow we're letting people down if words are expressed. And as I put in the book too, the, it, this debate is also happening in a background where there are people that are pushing the idea that a campus should be a place where nobody hears anything that offends them. Um, there are, uh, I don't know if in India, but here there are some people that are pushing the idea of what are called trigger warnings. In other words, you're going to be disturbed by something. We're going to let you know so you can avoid a class or not be disturbed. Um, there are ideas of, of intellectual safe spaces. There are ideas of you know microaggressions. Um, and all these things have, you know, some rationality to them. They're, you know, words can hurt, minor things can add up like paper cuts and, you know, they impact people. Words do hurt, absolutely. But when you try to say, okay, people should be sheltered from all these things as opposed to figure out how do they deal with them, you're robbing them of the ability to, to become critical thinkers. And you're also saying to them, there's a right way and a wrong way to think about these things. And it, it, it becomes, you know, almost authoritarian in its orientation because um, it, it, you know, defines the world in those dark terms. And that to me, you know, is, is undercutting again, what education can do. And, you know, as, as you point out, I have things in the, the book that show exactly how one can use uh, the educational model to do the opposite, to, to really engage thinking. Yeah, uh, and in fact, quoting from the book that you mentioned just now, the word uh, about safe space or trigger warning, you also talk about microaggression and you mock notions about and you say that campus experience is to make students uncomfortable to feel them disturbed. Uh, but uh, here you brought these two ideas that I want to talk about. You mentioned about students and faculties must be free to speak their minds without conscience. Uh, and you brought about the idea of free speech. So how do you balance that idea of free speech when it comes to also hate speech at the time and you talk about the idea of hate studies initially? So what's that line you're drawing? Because when uh, you do not have a safe space, where do you bring that idea of something which has been said is anti-Semitism or something which is uh, bringing the idea of a particular community 
uh, at uh, hand. I mean, uh, are they questioning the existence of an entire identity? So how do you draw that line actually? You know, it's a great question. And, you know, I'm fully cognizant of different countries have different standards of free speech in the US. We probably have the, the most protective in terms of the, how the First Amendment applies. Um, but when you're talking about an academic setting, the idea of academic freedom, which isn't synonymous, but it, it's related to, to free speech, um, to me, you know, is the, the core of this. So what it comes down to to me is that the distinction is not between what's hateful and what isn't. The distinction is between, on one hand, you don't want, you want to make sure it's so students clear, you don't want to have an environment where people are bullied. You don't want to have an environment where people are harassed. You don't want to have an environment where people are intimidated or discriminated against. Absolutely. That's clear. And it doesn't have to be on a basis of a racial or religious or ethnic or other class, you know, sexual or any other category. No student should be harassed or bullied or intimidated, you know, or discriminated against, period. So that's one bucket of what I think administrators need to focus on. When you're talking about ideas though, um, ideas that are not part of, um, you know, I'm harassing you by I'm saying these things to you at three in the morning and knocking on your door, that's harassment, doesn't matter what I say. Um, but ideas should be looked at from the merit of their own um, you know, existence and I'm not saying not to do anything about them. There are lots of ideas that I find very hateful. And what do you do? You speak out about them. You write about them. You expose about them. You explain why you think people are wrong about them. You engage in debate about those issues. You educate about them. You teach about them. Um, but you don't try to, to, to silence them um, because it, it, it creates, again, you know, to me, a, a toxic environment. You know, I'll, I'll share one example that wasn't from, uh, you know, my experience in teaching, but I, I remember um, this incident when I was at AJC. There was a, a professor that invited a Ku Klux Klan, you know, neo-Nazi leader to come and speak. And everybody was in a tizzy about it, which I fully understand. I mean, these folks want to kill black people. They don't particularly like me as a Jewish person, you know, to say the least. Um, so I understood the reaction to it, but the school eventually decided the person could be invited in and it was held off campus. But, you know, think of why the professor wanted to bring this student in, or this uh, Klan member in. He was teaching a journalism class. And the journalism class was to teach students, how do you interview a white supremacist? And I could tell you from having worked uh, with journalists and on um, people that were running for office, David Duke in particular, but others who were running you know, as neo-Nazis, um, journalists did a really lousy job by and large. They didn't know how to ask the questions. They didn't know when somebody was charming and deflected when they asked, are you a racist anymore? And they said, oh, no, no. They didn't know how to, to expose them. And this was to teach journalists how to do that. So, you know, again, if it's an educational purpose in particular like this, I don't care if somebody's coming in and saying something hateful, it's instructive. Um, an invitation to a campus or an inclusion of somebody's writings in a book uh, or showing a film or doing a, a program, bringing somebody in over Zoom, you know, an invitation does not mean endorsement. It means we're here to look at ideas. And, you know, one of the things that I'm sure, you know, your students, uh, just like students here and elsewhere, you know, should learn is the importance of primary sources. So, you know, if somebody's coming in and saying something hateful, um, and especially if there are people around the world or in particular countries that are following that particular line of logic, how can you not have students wrestle with those ideas? And how do you not show it in the primary source as opposed to having, you know, I, I think I write honestly about neo-Nazis and so forth, but it, why, would, why would people, students wanna have it filtered through people like me when they can engage some of the, the, these things, um, you know, directly? And uh, especially when you have conversations around, uh, especially Israel and Palestine, uh, both of them uh, unquestionable relation between the national national religious uh, community. Uh, we have seen the authors of Jewish Zionists in Israel, 
the also what we see when you Palestine uh, issue, we have seen the idea of uh, Palestinian Muslims that come into the picture. There's a close association between the nationality and region in both the cases. Uh, how do you have complex debate in academic discourse and how to have academic discourses when there's such a symbiotic relation between nationality and religious identity? Well, I think it's more, you know, it's, it's not as simple as you think because, or as you portray, because in the Jewish community, there's a lot of religious-based difference in terms of how people think about Israel, for example. You have uh, Satmar Jews, which are Hasidic, ultra-Orthodox, that are anti-Zionist. You have very involved Jewishly young people who are in a group called If Not Now uh, that are also anti-Zionist, uh, at least many of them are. Um, so their religion leads them to views about the Jewish state in different ways. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's not just a, if you're an Orthodox, you're more right on Israel. If you're a uh, reform or, um, you know, more liberal in your Judaism, you have a different view. There may be, I mean, my views, I'm a, I'm, I'm a Zionist. I'm a, you know, my wife is a rabbi and a reform movement and so forth. Um, but there are lots of different ways to look at it, look at questions of Israel based on your, your Jewish identity. And that's one of the things that concerns me about this whole debate on campus and particularly how um, you know, the, some of the legislation about the definition is being used because there's really an ongoing debate inside the Jewish community worldwide about whether being seen as inside the tent requires a particular view of Israel, does it require you to be a Zionist, um, you know, as I am. And I don't know how that, that question is gonna be answered. It's an internal Jewish communal debate. Maybe it can't be answered, but I never want government to decide it for the Jewish community. And by pushing the definition uh, to try to get the, the government to endorse it that way, does say something about um, you know, how the equities of that debate are gonna be decided. And I just don't want the government to be involved in that. Yeah, uh, so I have a couple of last questions uh, before we wrap this up. So uh, you also said that some of the young Jewish activists are anti-Zionist in large measure because of their understanding of Judaism and the impact to do justice. So do you think this uh, Jews from students, for example, you mentioned in the book, Students for justice in Palestine, Jewish cause for peace, and if not now, promoting anti-Semitism in some way. And I have another question. Uh, similarly, you mentioned about a lot of academic groups as well. Uh, for example, uh, the Canada Mission and uh, the AMCA for blacklisting academics and even students who cross ambiguous lines in Christian Israel. So you also criticize those groups uh, for promoting uh, uh, anti-normalization, uh, for example. So. Tell us about these two things in detail for our audience, actually. Well, sure. You know, again, it, it boils down to a, a lot of, of people feeling very zealous and righteous about their, you know, positions, which I understand, but not, again, engaging to my satisfaction what a campus ought to be about, about how you have discussions with ideas. So the, you know, the, the progressive Jewish groups, the if not now and, uh, you know, uh, Jewish Voice for Peace. And so, uh, you know, I don't generally accuse them by their political positions of anti-Semitism. I know some people on the Jewish right who say anti-Zionism is always anti-Semitism will, um, especially for Jewish Voice for Peace, for example, um, say that it's anti-Semitic. I don't I think anti-Zionism can or cannot be anti, you know, anti-Semitic is a much more complex thing. I've written about it, but, it's not that simple, uh, despite the fact of people wanting to, you know, to 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 push it that way. Um, you know, in in that context, um, the you know the idea uh, becomes we are so um, you know right on this, we are so correct on this. We again want to stop, you know, the other side uh, from from speaking. And again, I. I I, I find that problematic. I think it's important to speak out when people do go to the, you know, to historic anti-Semitic tracks, right? When the, the anti-Semitism, you know, we're talking about the larger definition, 
anti-Semitism in its core is two things. It's conspiracy theory about Jews trying to harm non-Jews and gives an explanation for what goes wrong in the world. So Jews poisoning wells, Jews making up the Holocaust, Jews killing Jesus, Jews, you know, all those things fit into that. There's sometimes that anti-Zionism is expressed with those tropes and should be called out because it's using those tropes, not because it's anti-Zionist. So that, you know, that's, that's on, on, on one side. Um, you know, on, on the other side, I, in, you know, the pro-Israel side, I, I see also trying to narrow the discussion um, on some of the campus, not letting people that want to talk about the occupation and you know, bringing in I, soldiers from the Israel Defense Forces to talk about things. Again, trying to make it very simple, and this is the parameter of what we're going to talk about. And I understand it from the funding perspective. I mean, people think, why am I, if I'm spending money because I'm concerned about these issues and I'm concerned about Jewish students, why do I want to spend money bringing in people who are going to say things that others at least are going to take um, and promote uh, things that vilify Israel? I don't want to fund that, as opposed to thinking that you want to really create a large tent for having these discussions. On the other side, the anti normalization, I find it problematic too. Listen, I, I, I get it. I understand the intern, the internal logic of it. Um, but again, it's, it, I mean, the, the idea is, again, you wouldn't sit down and have a cup of coffee with a Nazi. You wouldn't, why would you want to talk about, um, you know, the, the Israeli narrative when your view of the world is that the only narrative that has any justice to it is a pro-Palestinian one. If that's where, you, where your thinking leads you to, then it becomes the conclusion that you couldn't have a discussion. And I think, that, A, I think morally that's wrong. I think was, I have, I quote um, a moral philosopher, Jonathan Haidt in my book, that says morality both binds and blinds. And I think this is an example of it. It, it binds people together to feel that they have a moral mission. In this case, you know, the pro-Palestinian, there's only one side to this. Um, and it blinds them to, just as it blinds, you know, the, uh, the morality on the, on the strident pro-Israel side, blinds them to thinking about another way of looking at these issues. And when you come to that conclusion, it's, it's saying it's normalization. It would, again, we could have discussions between Republicans and Democrats, or at least we used to be able to in this country. You can have discussions on a, on a lot of different things. To do this is like sitting down with a Nazi. And, to me, that, that, that's, that's wrong. I don't believe that either side is the Nazi equivalent. And I also believe, by the way, that some of the anti-Palestinian rhetoric is also Islamophobic uh, and anti-Arab. But again, on the campus, the idea is we're all students here. We're all learning together. We have stridently different points of views of the equity of a conflict 60, you know, 700 miles away or whatever it is. Why don't we, you know, figure out how to discuss these. And so there are opportunities for quiet discussions or opportunities for classes or opportunities way to mind this. That's what the job should be. And if you want to become an absolute advocate for one side or the other, how do you not do that without learning what makes the other side tick and what better place to do that than a college campus? Yeah. So uh, let me come to an aspect which I really want to talk about before I end the conversation is what critiques are saying about the book actually. And this is one part I wanted to include because I also wanted to make this conversation inclusive so that a lot of people who were trying to boycott you was, or the book uh, realize that this conversation is kind of, uh, it's absolutely life and I'm not being editing out this part and I'm not giving you any questions before. So I wanted to ask you about what the critics have been saying. Since you mentioned in initial conversation that uh, you consider yourself a Zionist, how much of that uh, of your bias has seeped into the book uh, while you're writing it. And the second aspect of what I want to talk about, what uh, I was reading uh, a review and uh, the person who uh, critiqued your book mentioned about uh, your argument of 1940s, it's, and I quote, center of the conflict in terms of competing narratives, but you didn't incorporate the context of Israel later decision to absorb the West Bank without extending civil rights to Palestine, which threw the conflict back to its origin. And, uh, the, co the context that has been talking about is the shortcoming of the book in terms of actually trying to go through that history part uh, that uh, even though the top book has presented both the sides, it has a little shortcoming of the history. So is that is because of the bias that comes from your understanding of uh, you earlier mentioned 
or was it a conscious effort because this book was not about the history but of the larger campus debate around it yeah i mean that's a great last question i mean the the you know obviously everybody has biases and i i always try to be upfront about mine when i write uh and when i speak and when i teach um but you know i would not say i do you know i'm a, a an un, a, you know a, an abstract scale that has no things i'm certainly informed by my life experiences and what i've seen and what i've thought and what i've read and all those things but you're right i mean the book was not about this is what you need to know about the israel palestine conflict it was about how this is playing out on campus and how the debate uh, is harming the campus and how both sides are using this issue in a way that i found you know to be terribly destructive and the sadness that I found about the inability of people to get past the sort of purity test to use the academy as a very uh, positive place to have discussions about these issues. And I do have citations in the book to things by Paul Sham and, and uh, Kaplan and others that I think are really good if people are looking for fully engaged books that look at the complexities and the history and all that. I, I just gave enough of a background to it so people can know what the debate is about. Um, in terms of the, you know, people going after me, it's, it, I find it sort of fun. About, as I told the people, I wrote a book about the US militia movement right after the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, and I was speaking about it and I had armed militia guys coming to, you know, my talks. I'm less concerned about, you know, people having a different point of view about it, about Israel, Palestine. I mean, I, I, you know, right, it, it doesn't bother me. But what's interesting and I think sort of telling is the two instances where people had protested that I was invited to speak on a campus. Uh, one was the Zionist Organization of America, and actually, ironically, the, the local chapter of the American Jewish Committee in uh, Temple University. Why? There was a discussion there about anti-Semitism, and um, they believed that I was not sufficiently Zionistic enough and just blasting people on the, on the pro-Palestinian side. Flip forward a couple of months, I'm speaking at Barnard College, uh, doing a talk on anti-Semitism and a workshop on academic freedom. And uh, the Jewish Voice for Peace chapter says I shouldn't you know, be there because I had a hand in writing the definition and you know, it's a horrible thing of how it's been abused. I mean, the irony is people on both extremes said somebody shouldn't be able to be heard on the campus or at least had serious objections to it. And the, ir the further irony on the, the Jewish Voice for Peace side it's just a few months before that, they're sort of philosophical cousins in the UK because the definition is used there to really go after a lot of pro-Palestinian speech on campus, invited me to do a lecture about uh, you know, some of the things we were talking about today, about how the definition came about and how it's been abused. So again, you know, I saw, and this is a, a good place to, you know, to end, uh, I think. Uh, I saw a bit of graffiti 50 years ago when I was a first uh, year student at Bard College, and it said, if I didn't believe it with my own mind, I never would have seen it. And I think a lot of people try to you know, view the world that way. I see something and I try to make it conform uh, you know, to, uh, to my worldview rather than thinking through those issues. Yeah. Uh, and before we let you go, this is one thing that I wanted to ask you, if you can answer it very short. You started the book uh, with the idea of jurisprudence from the United States, and you mentioned about this case of Vince Thompson versus Michelle, which was a landmark case of hate crime. And based on that, I want to understand how can campus dynamics also change to accommodate all sides, uh, if you could envision an academic discourse for us and uh, leave, I mean, before we leave, uh, let you go. Well, you know, an ac academic, if I understood you correctly, the academic, you know, capacity to deal with hate, um, I think you know there are tons of, of opportunities there. I mean, we have at Bard, we have uh, you know tons of classes that intersect with hate. We have classes that focus on hate. We have interdisciplinary things, and I think that that's you know the academy can be such a great resource to policy officials and to um, NGOs and to others who are engaging issues of hate but can really drive theories of how do we know what works, what doesn't work, why, how we have to recalibrate, 
Um, and it's the movement of the field of hate studies of which, you know, there was one that started at Gonzaga University 20 years ago. There are now a bunch actually across the world. There's one in Limerick, there's an international association. Um, and I think there's a lot of brain power of people thinking across disciplines of how hatred works and combining that for people's utility that uh, on government and elsewhere. And you know, there are people that are interested in figuring out how to set up a hate studies center uh, or how to have courses on that. Uh, I'm happy to engage with anybody. You know, they, I'll give you my uh, email. It's kstern at bard.edu. It's again, K-S-T-E-R-N at bard.edu. And I'm happy to engage um, with anyone. Thank you so much, Ken, for taking your time and speaking to us. Uh, I know you might be running late, but I hope this was a meaningful conversation and uh, we could somewhere uh, lay down a ground principle that e uh, even uh, there are people whom our viewers might not agree with you, but all, all got us the flavor of what it, the conversation should be to let the other person speak. And I hope you enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just sorry we're not in person together, but maybe some, some other time. Yeah.